All right, so <clears throat> welcome to my series of videos on statistics. And um, in this particular video, I'm going to talk about um, how to answer practical questions in the context of a quiz. So it's actually um, a feedback on a quiz that was written. Now, section A. Now for every statistics exam, what is important is that never forget to read the instructions. So usually there are a list of Z critical values there are a list of T critical values, which you have to read the instructions before you come up with those figures. So sometimes you may not necessarily need a table because all the figures for the Z and T might have been provided in the question where we need to pay attention. Now, section A is essentially objectives, which were 15 multiple choice questions, and you are supposed to choose the correct answer. So section A, starts with a preamble that says that a researcher is investigating the average daily screen time of teenagers in a certain city. The researcher believes that the average daily screen time is more than four hours. A random sample of 36 teenagers were selected and their screen time is recorded. The sample mean is 4.5. The population standard deviation is known to be 1.2 hours. Assume the population is normally distributed use the significance level alpha for all questions. So when you say all questions, we mean question one to question seven. Now, this question is essential about hypothesis testing for single population mean when standard deviation is known. And you, if you have remembered from our earlier um, sessions, you should know how to state a hypothesis. Now in stating a hypothesis, whether it is a status quo or a research hypothesis or a claim. The golden rule is this. Anytime the hypothesis has these three signs, that is less than, it has greater than, or it has not equal to. So anytime a hypothesis has less than, greater than, or not equal to, it should feature in the alternative hypothesis. However, if a hypothesis has less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or the equal to sign, when it has these three signs, it must feature in the now hypothesis. So this is essentially how we write a hypothesis. Now, the researcher believes that the average daily screen time is more than four hours. What does it mean? It means that the average is greater than four. So essentially, once we say the mean or the average is greater than four, once it has this, this sign, this sign, or that sign, it means that this must feature in the alternative hypothesis. Okay. And then the opposite, because the null hypothesis is just the opposite of the alternative hypothesis, or the alternative hypothesis is also the opposite of now. So the null and alternative, they must exhaust all possible probability values. If that is the case, what it means is that our now, the opposite here, should be mu less than or equal to four. It can't be mu is less than four because then it will not exhaust all the probability space. So if the alternative is greater than four, it means the now must be less than or equal to four. So question one says that, what is the null hypothesis for this test? And it's essentially B, which says that mu is less than or equal to four. Question two says that what is the alternative hypothesis for this test? And it's essentially mu is greater than four. Then the question says, what is the z-score for this hypothesis test? Now remember, if you are, if you are computing z-score for single population mean when standard deviation is known, z will be equal to sample mean minus population mean over the standard error. And all these figures are essentially provided in the question. So here, the sample mean is 4.5. The population mean is the one always in the hypothesis. So that is four 
because essentially we find a um, population mean in the hypothesis divided by the population standard deviation, which we know it to be 1.2 all over square root of the sample size of 36. So if you point this correctly, you should get the answer to be 2.5. You should get the answer to be 2.5 to point this correctly. Now, question four, what is the critical value for this one tailed test? And essentially, these are some of the things you can find on the cover page of every exams, right? When it comes to Z values, we have Z critical for one tail. So um, we have 90%, we have 95, and we have 99. And then the Z critical for one tail values are there. and then Z critical for two-tailed. And essentially we use two-tailed when we are doing um, confidence intervals. So I'm sure most of us are familiar that here is 1.645, here is 1.960, and here is 2.575. And essentially, when it comes to if it was if it is one tilt, the critical value for 90% confidence level is. 1.282, 95 will be 1.645, and 99 will be 2.326. So usually in every exam, most of these figures are actually provided on the exam question, okay? So when it comes to the significance level, the significance level and the confidence level will sum up to 100%. So here, when we are talking about significance level of 0 0.05, we actually mean a confidence level of 95%. And because the null and alternative, the null and alternative have the greater than, and I mean, the, the less than sign and the greater than sign, then it becomes one tailed. So technically, the only thing that is two tailed is when the null hypothesis has a straight equal to sign. Apart from that, when it is less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, then it becomes one tailed. So essentially, the critical value here for 5% significance level or alpha level is 1.645. So it's A here. Now, our computed Z and our critical Z. So remember, this is how we conclude in a hypothesis. So here, we draw a diagram which I believe if you become an expert, you don't need to draw, right? So here, the null hypothesis is that, if you remember, our mean, the, the mean is actually four, right? So essentially, I mean, four in the null hypothesis. So essentially, any figure less than four or any z-score less than zero, because remember, z-score at the middle is always zero. So any figure less than four, or any z-score less than zero means that we cannot reject the null hypothesis when we use the sample evidence. So anytime your null hypothesis is less than or equal to, because of a sampling error, we allow for a little greater than, because the null says less than or equal to. So because of sampling error, because we are using a sample evidence to test this hypothesis, we allow for a little greater than. So we allow for a little greater than up to this point. Or any, you can draw essential at any point, but it must be greater than four. So after the bound that we have allowed for, we shade here and see that this is the rejection region. Okay, rejection region. Now this rejection region, the bound must have a critical Z, which we have read to be 1.645. So essentially, when we are concluding on this hypothesis, So essentially, if you are concluding on this hypothesis, we are going to reject the null hypothesis for every z-score greater than 1.645 because it's going to be in the rejection region. So our computer z-score was 2.50. The critical z was 1.645. So here, what we do is that based on the results of this hypothesis, we are going to reject it. Why? 
because the computer Z of 2.5 is greater than the critical Z of 1.645. So the null hypothesis will be rejected. So here, there are two options that talks about the null hypothesis being rejected. Option A says that rejects null hypothesis, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the average daily screen time is more than four hours. And one of the things I want you to know is that anytime you reject the null, the alternative becomes the conclusion, okay? So the answer couldn't have been C. C says that rejects the null hypothesis because there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the average daily screen time is exactly four hours. The reason why the answer is not C is that the alternative is not mu is equal to four, okay? So the answer is A because the alternative is that the average daily screen time is more than four hours. Now, six, suppose evidence from the population from which the sample was obtained shows that the average daily screen time is less than four hours. What error would have been committed in this hypothesis testing in five above? Now, when it comes to errors in hypothesis testing, first of all, you must judge whether the null hypothesis is true or false. How do I know if a null hypothesis is true or false? I'm going to compare the null hypothesis to evidence from population. If the null hypothesis is in line with evidence from population, then it makes the null hypothesis true. But if the null hypothesis is not in line with evidence from population, then it makes the null hypothesis false. So let's remember our null hypothesis was mu is less than or equal to four. So here, it says that suppose evidence from population from which the sample was obtained shows that the average daily screen time is less than four. So what does it mean? This statement from that, that comes from the, the, the evidence from population shows that the thing is less than four. It's, so it's in line with the null hypothesis, which says mu is less than or equal to four. So that makes the null hypothesis true because the evidence from population is in line with the null hypothesis. Now, what did we do to it in five above? In question five above, the null hypothesis was rejected. So what has happened is that if this is the evidence from the population, what we might have done is that we might have rejected a, what, what we might have done is that we might have rejected a true null hypothesis. Right? That's what we have done. We might have rejected a true null hypothesis. And in statistics, when you reject a true null hypothesis, it is called type one error. Question seven. Suppose evidence from the population from which the sample was obtained shows that the average daily screen time is more than four hours. Now, let's look at something. Evidence from population shows that the thing is more than four hours. So if you compare the statement more than four hours to this null hypothesis, which, is, which says less than or equal to four hours, it makes the null hypothesis false in the context of question seven. So if you have a null hypothesis, then in question five, whether it was true or false, the idea was that question five, it was rejected. So in the context of question seven, once that we have established that the null hypothesis was false based on the requirement of question seven, and it was rejected from question five, then we could say that we have rejected a false null hypothesis, and this means that there is no error, okay? So when you reject a false null hypothesis, there is no error. When a false null hypothesis is rejected, it means there is no error. Okay. Now, question eight to 12. Use the following preamble to answer questions eight to 12. Now, the question says that you are interested in whether excess risk adjusted return, that's alpha, is correlated with mutual funds expenses ratio for Ghanaian large cap group funds. The following table represents, or sorry, presents a sample. So we have alpha figures. 
and then we have expense ratio figures. So we are looking at correlation. Now by default, the null hypothesis for correlation is that there is no correlation or there is no significant correlation. And then the alternative is that there is a significant correlation. So that makes the answer C. So the question says, the appropriate hypothesis for the correlation is what? The answer is C. R is equal to zero to show that there is no significant correlation. And then R is not equal to zero to show that there is significant correlation. Number nine, the Pearson correlation coefficient is closest to. So if you want to find the Pearson correlation coefficient, essentially you can use your calculator to punch the answer, right? When you are doing multiple choice, there is no essence in doing the n sigma x, y minus sigma x, sigma y, all over n sigma x squared minus sigma x, all squared, multiplying n sigma y squared minus sigma y, all squared, then we have a square root of this, okay? Essentially, it is not important to, I mean, use this formula. Once the calculator can punch it, all right, you just fit in your calculator, you go to the statistics mode, and then you are able to solve this, okay? All right. So essentially, if you plot the figures in this formula, you are going to get the Pearson correlation coefficient to be 0 0.952. Now, the value of the appropriate test statistic is closest to. Now, remember, if you want to do hypothesis testing for, for, a, um, for correlation, it is the t value, where we say t is equal to the correlation coefficient over square root of one minus the correlation coefficient squared all over n minus two. So in this question, our number of pairs of items, I believe were nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so they were nine. Now, if they were nine, what it means is that our n is nine and we have our r, so we're now going to have t is equal to 0 0.952 all over square root of one minus 0 0.952 squared, all over nine minus two. So essentially, if you punch the calculator correctly, you have approximately 8.23 as an answer. Now, if the critical values are 2.360, what to be the decision on the hypothesis. So remember, correlation is two-tailed because R is equal to zero. So we draw our diagram two-tailed to show that R is equal to zero. So it means that we have to allow for a little more and a little less. So that's why we have the bounds, the critical bounds to be two. So here will be the negative side where minus T is equal to 2.306 per the question, sorry, minus 2.306 the question, and then a positive t is equal to 2.306 per the question. Okay, now, here becomes the rejection region for this side, here also becomes the rejection region for this side. So remember, our computed t was 8.23. Now, if there's a number line, I want to plot 8.23, it will definitely be greater than 2.306. Right, so it will be somewhere in the rejection region somewhere here, all right? So here, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. And of course, our conclusion will be that there is a significant correlation. Now, if there is a significant correlation, if there is a significant correlation, that is when we are now confident and comfortable to explain the correlation coefficient. So in question 12, it says that based on your based on your answer in 11 above, it can be concluded that. So here, our conclusion will be that the correlation of 0 0.952 was significant. And if it is significant, it means that there is a positive correlation because it was a positive figure. So it means that alpha is positively correlated with expense ratio. 
Use the following preamble to answer questions 13 to 15. Questions 13 to 15 says that an analyst has estimated a model that regresses a company's return on equity against its growth opportunities. And it produced the following estimated linear regression results. So this is an estimated results, right? Where ROE is the dependent variable. Of course, the four here will be the constant or the y-intercept. And then we have the beta coefficient to be 1.8 then growth opportunity plus error term. Now, 13, the predicted value of the company's return on equity if the growth opportunity is 10 is closest to. So here, it just asks you to predict. So ROE is equal to 4 plus 1.8 into bracket 10%. So 4 plus 1.8 into bracket 10, when you predict it, you are going to have, oh, sorry, when you predict it, you are going to have 22%, okay? Number 14, the change in ROE for a change in growth opportunity from five to six is closest to. So if the growth opportunity is five, our ROE will be four plus 1.8 into bracket five. If, RO, if the growth opportunity is six, the ROE will be, Four plus one point eight into bracket six. So four plus one point eight into bracket five, which is thirteen, and four plus one point eight into bracket six, which is fourteen point eight percent. So the change will be one point eight. Number fifteen. The residual in the case of growth opportunity of eight percent and an actual ROE is closest to. But when we say residual, we mean the error term, or actual Y minus predicted Y, okay? So if growth opportunity is eight, the predicted return on equity, right, will be equal to four plus 1.8 into bracket eight. So we have four plus 1.8 into bracket eight, and that is 18.4. That would be the predicted ROE. So if you find a difference between the actual, I say if the actual is 21, so that would be 21% minus 18.4%. So you are going to get 2.6%. So this will bring us to the end of the discussion on the multiple choice. In the next video, I'm going to talk about the essay part where we had to do some calculations. So um, yeah, we meet in the next video. Please subscribe, share, um, comment, and um, like the video. Thank you.